St. Augustine, 354 to 430. 1. The Sinner. The North Africa in which Augustine was born was a miscellany of breeds and creeds. Punic and Numidian blood mingled with Roman in the population, perhaps in Augustine. So many of the people spoke Punic, the old Phoenician language of Carthage, that Augustine as bishop appointed only priests who could speak it. Donatism challenged orthodoxy, Manichaeism challenged both, and apparently the majority of the people were still pagan. Augustine's birthplace was Tagaste in Numidia. His mother, St. Monica, was a devoted Christian whose life was almost consumed in caring and praying for her wayward son. His father was a man of narrow means and broad principles whose infidelities were patiently accepted by Monica in the firm belief that they could not last forever. At twelve, the boy was sent to school at Madara, and at seventeen to higher studies at Carthage. Salvian would soon describe Africa as the cesspool of the world, and Carthage as the cesspool of Africa, hence Monica's parting advice to her son. She commanded me, and with much earnestness forewarned me, that I should not commit fornication, and especially that I should never defile any man's wife. These seemed to me no better than women's counsels, which it would be a shame for me to follow. I ran headlong with such blindness that I was ashamed among my equals to be guilty of less impudency than they were, whom I heard brag mightily of their naughtiness, yea, and so much the more boasting by how much more they had been beastly. And I took pleasure to do it, not for the pleasure of the act only, but for the praise of it also. And when I lacked opportunity to commit a wickedness that should make me as bad as the lost, I would feign myself to have done what I never did. He proved an apt pupil in Latin also, and in rhetoric, mathematics, music, and philosophy. My unquiet mind was altogether intent to seek for learning. He disliked Greek, and never mastered it or learned its literature, but he was so fascinated by Plato that he called him a demigod, and did not cease to be a Platonist when he became a Christian. His pagan training in logic and philosophy prepared him to be the most subtle theologian of the church. Having graduated, he taught grammar at Tagaste, and then rhetoric at Carthage. Since he was now sixteen, there was much ado to get me a wife. However, he preferred a concubine, a convenience sanctioned by pagan morals and Roman law. Still unbaptized, Augustine could take his morals where he pleased. Concubinage was for him a moral advance. He abandoned promiscuity and seems to have been faithful to his concubine until their parting in 385. In 382, still a lad of eighteen, he found himself unwillingly the father of a son, whom he called at one time son of my sin, but more usually Adiodotus, gift of God. He came to love the boy tenderly and never let him go far from his side. At twenty-nine he left Carthage for the larger world of Rome. His mother, fearing that he would die unbaptized, begged him not to go, and when he persisted, besought him to take her with him. He pretended to consent, but at the dock he left her at prayer in a chapel and sailed without her. At Rome he taught rhetoric for a year, but the students cheated him of his fees, and he applied for a professorship at Milan. Symmachus examined him, approved, and sent him to Milan by state post. There his brave mother overtook him and persuaded him to listen with her to the sermons of Ambrose. He was moved by them, but even more by the hymns the congregation sang. At the same time, Monica won him over to the idea of marriage, and in effect betrothed him, now thirty-two, to a girl with more money than years. Augustine agreed to wait two years till she should be twelve. As a preliminary, he sent his mistress back to Africa, where she buried her grief in a nunnery. A few weeks of continence unnerved him, and instead of marrying, he took another concubine. Give me chastity, he prayed, but not yet. Amid these diversions he found time for theology. He had begun with his mother's simple faith, but had cast it off proudly at school. For nine years, from 374 to 383, he accepted Manichaean dualism as the most satisfactory explanation of a world so indifferently compounded of evil and good. For a time he flirted with the skepticism of the later academy, but he was too emotional to remain long in suspended judgment. At Rome and Milan he studied Plato and Plotinus. Neoplatonism entered deeply into his philosophy, and through him dominated Christian theology till Abelard. It became for Augustine the vestibule to Christianity. Ambrose had recommended him to read the Bible in the light of Paul's statement that the letter killeth, but the spirit maketh to live. Augustine found that a symbolic interpretation removed what had seemed to him the puerilities of Genesis. He read Paul's epistles and felt that here was a man who, like himself, had passed through a thousand doubts. In Paul's final faith there had been no mere abstract platonic logos, but a divine word that had become man.
One day, as Augustine sat in a Milan garden with his friend Olypius, a voice seemed to keep ringing in his ears, Take up and read, take up and read. He opened Paul again and read, Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. The passage completed for Augustine a long evolution of feeling and thought. There was something infinitely warmer and deeper in this strange faith than in all the logic of philosophy. Christianity came to him as a profound emotional satisfaction. Surrendering the skepticism of the intellect, he found for the first time in his life moral stimulus and mental peace. His friend Olypius confessed himself ready for a like submission. Monica, receiving their capitulation, melted her heart out in grateful prayer. On Easter Sunday of 387, Augustine, Olypius, and Adiodotus were baptized by Ambrose, with Monica standing happily by. All four resolved to go to Africa and live a monastic life. At Ostia, Monica died, confident of reunion in paradise. Arrived in Africa, Augustine sold his modest patrimony and gave the proceeds to the poor. Then he and Olypius and some friends formed a religious community and lived at Tagaste in poverty, celibacy, study, and prayer. So was founded, in 388, the Augustinian Order, the oldest monastic fraternity in the West. 2. The Theologian In 389, Adiodotus passed away, and Augustine mourned him as bitterly as if still uncertain of the eternal bliss awaiting those who died in Christ. Work and writing were his only consolations. In 391, Valerius, bishop of nearby Hippo, now Bone, asked his aid in administering the diocese, and for this purpose ordained him a priest. Valerius often yielded the pulpit to him, and Augustine's eloquence impressed the congregation even when they could not understand him. Hippo was a seaport of some 40,000 population. The Catholics had one church there, the Donatists another. The remainder of the people were Manichaeans or pagans. The Manichaean bishop, Fortunatus, had hitherto dominated the theological scene. Donatists joined Catholics in urging Augustine to meet him in debate. He consented, and for two days these novel gladiators crossed words before a crowd that filled the baths of Socius. Augustine won. Fortunatus left Hippo and never returned, this in 392. Four years later, Valerius, alleging his age, asked the congregation to choose his successor. Augustine was unanimously elected, and though he protested and wept and begged the privilege of returning to his monastery, he was prevailed upon, and for the remaining thirty-four years of his life he was bishop of Hippo. From this foot of earth he moved the world. He chose one or two deacons and brought two monks from his monastery to help him. They lived monastically and communistically in the Episcopal rectory. Augustine was a bit puzzled to understand how one of his aides at death could leave a tidy legacy. All subsisted on a vegetarian diet, reserving meat for guests and the sick. Augustine himself is described as short and thin, and never strong. He complained of a lung disorder and suffered unduly from the cold. He was a man of sensitive nerves, easily excited, of keen and somewhat morbid imagination, of subtle and flexible intellect. Despite a tenacious dogmatism and some occasional intolerance, he must have had many lovable qualities. Several men who came to learn rhetoric from him accepted his lead into Christianity, and Olypius followed him to the end. He had hardly taken his seat as bishop when he began a lifelong war against the Donatists. He challenged their leaders to public debate, but few cared to accept. He invited them to friendly conferences, but was met first with silence, then with insult, then with violence. Several Catholic bishops in North Africa were assaulted, and some attempts seemed to have been made upon the life of Augustine himself. However, we do not have the Donatist side of this story. In 411, a council called by the Emperor Honorius met at Carthage to quiet the Donatist dispute. The Donatists sent 279 bishops, the Catholics 286. But bishop in Africa meant little more than parish priest. The Emperor's legate, Marcellinus, after hearing both sides, decreed that the Donatists must hold no further meetings and must hand over all their churches to the Catholics. The Donatists replied with acts of desperate violence, including, we are told, the murder of Restitutus, a priest of Hippo, and the mutilation of another member of Augustine's staff. Augustine urged the government to enforce its decree vigorously. He retracted his earlier view that no one should be coerced into the unity of Christ, that we must fight only by arguments and prevail only by force of reason. He concluded that the church, 
being the spiritual father of all, should have a parent's right to chastise an unruly son for his own good. It seemed to him better that a few Donatists should suffer than that all should be damned for want of coercion. At the same time, he pled repeatedly with the state officials not to enforce the death penalty against the heretics. Aside from this bitter contest and the cares of his see, Augustine lived in the country of the mind and labored cheaply with his pen. Almost every day he wrote a letter whose influence is still active in Catholic theology. His sermons alone fill volumes, and though some are spoiled by an artificial rhetoric of opposed and balanced clauses, and many deal with local and transient topics in a simple style adapted to his unlettered congregation, many of them rise to a noble eloquence born of mystic passion and profound belief. His busy mind, trained in the logic of the schools, could not be confined within the issues of his parish. In treatise after treatise he labored to reconcile with reason the doctrines of the church that he had come to revere as the one pillar of order and decency in a ruined and riotous world. He knew that the Trinity was a stumbling block to the intellect. For fifteen years he worked on his most systematic production, De Trinitate, struggling to find analogies in human experience for three persons in one God. More puzzling still, filling all Augustine's life with wonder and debate, was the problem of harmonizing the free will of man with the foreknowledge of God. If, if God is omniscient, he sees the future in all details. Since God is immutable, this picture that he has of all coming events lays upon them the necessity of occurring as he has foreseen them. They are irrevocably predestined. Then how can man be free? Must he not do what God has foreseen? And if God has foreseen all things, he has known from all eternity the final fate of every soul that he creates. Why, then, should he create those that are predestined to be damned? In his first years as a Christian, Augustine had written a treatise, De Libero Arbitrio, on free will. He had sought then to square the existence of evil with the benevolence of an omnipotent God, and his answer was that evil is the result of free will. God could not leave man free without giving him the possibility of doing wrong as well as right. Later, under the influence of Paul's epistles, he argued that Adam's sin had left upon the human race a stain of evil inclination, that no amount of good works, but only the freely given grace of God, could enable the soul to overcome this inclination, erase this stain, and achieve salvation. God offered this grace to all, but many refused it. God knew that they would refuse it, but this possibility of damnation was the price of that moral freedom without which man would not be man. The divine foreknowledge does not destroy this freedom, God merely foresees the choices that men will freely make. Augustine did not invent the doctrine of original sin. Paul, Tertullian, Cyprian, Ambrose had taught it, but his own experience of sin and of the voice that had converted him had left in him a somber conviction that the human will is from birth inclined to evil and can be turned to good only by the gratuitous act of God. He could not explain the evil inclination of the will except as an effect of Eve's sin and Adam's love. Since we are all children of Adam, Augustine argued, we share his guilt, are indeed the offspring of his guilt. The original sin was concupiscence. And concupiscence still befouls every act of generation. By the very connection of sex with parentage, mankind is a mass of perdition, and most of us will be damned. Some of us will be saved, but only through the grace of the suffering Son of God and through the intercession of the mother who conceived him sinlessly. Through a woman we were sent to destruction, through a woman, salvation was restored to us. Writing so much and so hurriedly, often it appears by dictation to amanuenses, Augustine fell more than once into exaggerations which later he strove to modify. At times he propounded the Calvinistic doctrine that God arbitrarily chose from all eternity the elect to whom he would give his saving grace. A crowd of critics rose to plague him for such theories. He conceded nothing but fought every point to the end. From England came his ablest opponent, the footloose monk Pelagius, with a strong defense of man's freedom and of the saving power of good works. God indeed helps us, said Pelagius, by giving us his law and commandments, by the example and precepts of his saints, by cleansing waters of baptism and the redeeming blood of Christ. But God does not tip the scales against our salvation by making human nature inherently evil. There was no original sin, no fall of man, only he who commits a sin is punished for it. It transmits no guilt to his progeny. God does not predestine man to heaven or hell, does not choose arbitrarily whom he will damn or save. He leaves the choice of our fate to ourselves. The theory of innate human depravity, said Pelagius, was a cowardly shifting to God of the blame for man's sins. 
Man feels and therefore is responsible. If I ought, I can. Pelagius came to Rome about 400, lived with pious families, and earned a reputation for virtue. In 409 he fled from Alaric, first to Carthage, then to Palestine. There he dwelt in peace till the Spanish priest Orotius came from Augustine to warn Jerome against him, this in 415. An eastern synod tried the monk and declared him orthodox. An African synod, prodded by Augustine, repudiated this finding and appealed to Pope Innocent I, who declared Pelagius a heretic, whereupon Augustine hopefully announced, Causa finita est, the case is finished. But Innocent, dying, was succeeded by Zosimus, who pronounced Pelagius guiltless. The African bishops appealed to Honorius. The emperor was pleased to correct the pope. Zosimus yielded in 418, and the council of Ephesus in 431 condemned as a heresy the Pelagian view that man can be good without the helping grace of God. Augustine could be caught in contradictions and absurdities, even in morbid cruelties of thought, but he could not be overcome, because in the end his own soul's adventures and the passion of his nature, not any chain of reasoning, molded his theology. He knew the weakness of the intellect. It was the individual's brief experience sitting in reckless judgment upon the experience of the race. And how could forty years understand forty centuries? Dispute not by excited argument, he wrote to a friend, those things which you do not yet comprehend, or those which in the scriptures appear to be incongruous and contradictory. Meekly defer the day of your understanding. Faith must precede understanding. Seek not to understand that you may believe, but, but believe that you may understand. Crede ut intelligas. The authority of the Scriptures is higher than all the efforts of the human intelligence. The Bible, however, need not always be taken literally. It was written to be intelligible to simple minds, and had to use corporeal terms for spiritual realities. When interpretations differ, we must rest in the decision of the Church councils, in the collective wisdom of her wisest men. But even faith is not enough for understanding. There must be a clean heart to let in the rays of the divinity that surrounds us. So, humbled and cleansed, one may, after many years, rise to the real end and essence of religion, which is the possession of the living God. I desire to know God and the soul. Nothing more, nothing whatever. Oriental Christianity spoke mostly of Christ. Augustine's theology is of the first person. It is of and to God the Father that he speaks and writes. He gives no description of God, for only God can know God fully. Probably the true God has neither sex, age, nor body. But we can know God, in a sense, intimately through creation. Everything in the world is an infinite marvel in its organization and functioning, and would be impossible without a creative intelligence. The order, symmetry, and rhythm of living things proclaims a kind of platonic deity in whom beauty and wisdom are one. We need not believe, says Augustine, that the world was created in six days, Probably God in the beginning created only a nebulous mass, nebulosa species, but in this mass lay the seminal order, or productive capacities, rationes seminales, from which all things would develop by natural causes. For Augustine, as for Plato, the actual objects and events of this world pre-existed in the mind of God as the plan of a building is conceived by the architect before it is built and creation proceeds in time according to these eternal exemplars in the divine mind. 3. The Philosopher How shall we do justice so briefly to so powerful a personality and so fertile a pen? Through 230 treatises he spoke his mind on almost every problem of theology and philosophy, and usually in a style warm with feeling and bright with new coined phrases from his copious mint. He discussed with diffidence and subtlety the nature of time. He anticipated Descartes' cogito ergo sum. To refute the academics who denied that man can be certain of anything, he argued, who doubts that he lives and thinks? For if he doubts, he lives. He presaged Bergson's complaint that the intellect, through long dealing with corporeal things, is a constitutional materialist. He proclaimed, like Kant, that the soul is the most directly known of all realities, and clearly stated the idealistic position, that since matter is known only through mind, we cannot logically reduce mind to matter. He suggested the Schopenhauerian thesis that will, not intellect, is fundamental in man. And he agreed with Schopenhauer that the world would be improved if all reproduction should cease. Two of his works belong to the classics of the world's literature, 
The Confessions, circa 400, is the first and most famous of all autobiographies. It is addressed directly to God as a 100,000-word act of contrition. It begins with the sins of his youth, tells vividly the story of his conversion, and occasionally bursts into a rhapsody of prayer. All confessions are camouflage, but there was in this one a sincerity that shocked the world. Even as Augustine wrote it, 46 and a bishop, the old carnal ideas still live in my memory and rush into my thoughts. In sleep they come upon me not to delight only, but even so far as consent, and most like to the deed. Bishops are not always so psychoanalytically frank. His masterpiece is the moving story of how one soul came to faith and peace, and its first lines are its summary. Thou hast created us for thyself, and our hearts know no rest until they repose in thee. His faith is now unquestioning, and rises to a moving theodicy. Too late I came to love thee, O thou beauty, both so ancient and so fresh. Yea, also the heaven and the earth, and all that is in them, bid me on every side that I should love thee. What now do I love when I love thee? I asked the earth, and it answered, I am not it. I asked the sea, and the deeps and the creeping things, and they answered, We are not thy God, seek above us. I asked the fleeting winds, and the whole air with its inhabitants answered me, Anaximenes was deceived, I am not God. I asked the heavens, the sun and moon and stars, nor said they, Are we the God whom thou seekest? And I replied unto all these, Answer me concerning God. Since that you are not he, answer me concerning him. And they cried out with a loud voice, He made us. They are not well in their wits to whom anything which thou hast created is displeasing. In thy gift we rest, and in thy good pleasure lies our peace. The Confessions is poetry and prose. The City of God, 413 to 426, is philosophy and history. When the news of Alaric's sack of Rome reached Africa, followed by thousands of desolate refugees, Augustine was stirred, like Jerome and others, by what seemed an irrational and satanic calamity. Why should the city whose beauty and power men had built and reverenced through centuries, and now the citadel of Christendom, be surrendered by a benevolent deity to the ravages of barbarians? Pagans everywhere attributed the disaster to Christianity. The ancient gods, plundered, dethroned, and proscribed, had withdrawn their protection from the Rome that under their guidance had grown and prospered for a thousand years. Many Christians were shaken in their faith. Augustine felt the challenge deeply. All his vast temple of theology threatened to collapse if this panic of fear were not allayed. He resolved to devote all the powers of his genius to convincing the Roman world that such catastrophes did not for a moment impugn Christianity. For thirteen years he labored on his book amid oppressive obligations and distractions. He published it in piecemeal installments. The middle of it forgot the beginning and did not foresee the end. Inevitably, its twelve hundred pages become a confused concatenation of essays on everything from the first sin to the last judgment, and only the depth of its thought and the splendor of its style lifted it out of its chaos to the highest rank in the literature of Christian philosophy. Augustine's initial answer was that Rome had been punished not for her new religion, but for her continued sins. He described the indecency of the pagan stage, and quoted Sallust and Cicero on the corruption of Roman politics. Once Rome had been a nation of Stoics, strengthened by Catos and Scipios. She had almost created law, and had given order and peace to half the world. In those heroic days God had made his face to shine upon her. But the seeds of moral decay lay in the very religion of ancient Rome, in gods who encouraged rather than checked the sexual nature of man. The god Virginius to loose the virgin's girdle, Subagus to place her under the man, Prema to press her down, Priapus upon whose huge and beastly member the new bride was commanded by religious order to get up and sit. Rome was punished because she worshipped, not because she neglected such deities. The barbarians spared Christian churches and those who fled to them, but showed no mercy to the remnants of pagan shrines. How then could the invaders be the agents of a pagan revenge? Augustine's second answer was a philosophy of history, an attempt to explain the events of recorded time on one universal principle. From Plato's conception of an ideal state existing somewhere in heaven, from St. Paul's thought of a community of saints living and dead, from the Donatist Tychonius's doctrine of two societies, one of God and one of Satan, Augustine took the basic idea of his book as a tale of two cities, the earthly city of worldly men devoted to earthly affairs and joys, and the divine city of the past, present, and future worshippers of the one true God. Marcus Aurelius had provided a noble phrase, 
the poet could say of Athens, Thou lovely city of sea crops, and shall not thou say of the world, Thou lovely city of God? But Aurelius had meant by this the whole orderly universe. The Civitas Dei, says Augustine, was founded by the creation of the angels, the Civitas Terrena by the rebellion of Satan. Mankind is divided into two sorts, such as live according to man, and such as live according to God. These we mystically call the two cities, or societies, the one predestined to reign eternally with God, the other condemned to perpetual torment with the devil. An actual city or empire need not in all aspects be confined within the earthly city. It may do good things, legislate wisely, judge justly, and aid the church. And these good actions take place, so to speak, within the city of God. This spiritual city, again, is not identical with the Catholic Church. The Church, too, may have terrestrial interests, and its members may fall into self-seeking and sin, slipping from one city into the other. Only at the last judgment will the two cities be separate and distinct. By a symbolic extension of her membership to heavenly as well as to earthly souls, to pre-Christian as well as Christian righteous men, the Church may be, and by Augustine occasionally is, identified with the city of God. The Church would later accept this identification as an ideological weapon of politics, and would logically deduce from Augustine's philosophy the doctrine of a theocratic state, in which the secular powers, derived from men, would be subordinate to the spiritual power held by the Church and derived from God. With this book, paganism as a philosophy ceased to be, and Christianity as a philosophy began. It was the first definitive formulation of the medieval mind. 4. The Patriarch The old lion of the faith was still at his post when the Vandals came. To the end he remained in the theological arena, felling new heresies, countering critics, answering objections, resolving difficulties. He considered gravely whether woman will retain her sex in the next world, whether the deformed and the mutilated, the thin and the fat, will be reborn as they were, how those will be restored who were eaten by others in a famine. But age had come upon him with sad indignities. Asked about his health, he replied, In spirit I am well, in body I am confined to bed. I can neither walk nor stand nor sit down because of swelling piles. Yet even so, since that is the Lord's good pleasure, what should I say but that I am well? He had done his best to deter Boniface from rebellion against Rome, and had shared in recalling him to loyalty. As Geyseric advanced, many bishops and priests asked Augustine should they stay at their posts or flee. He bade them stay and gave example. When the Vandals laid siege to Hippo, Augustine maintained the morale of the starving people by his sermons and his prayers. In the third month of the siege he died, aged seventy-six. He left no will, having no goods, but he had written his own epitaph. What maketh the heart of the Christian heavy? The fact that he is a pilgrim, and longs for his own country. Few men in history have had such influence. Eastern Christianity never took to him, partly because he was thoroughly un-Greek in his limited learning and in his subordination of thought to feeling and will, partly because the Eastern Church had already submitted to the state. But in the West he gave a definitive stamp to Catholic theology. Anticipating and inspiring Gregory the Seventh and Innocent the Third, he formulated the claim of the Church to supremacy over the mind and the state and the great battles of popes against emperors and kings were political corollaries of his thought. Until the thirteenth century he dominated Catholic philosophy, giving it a Neoplatonic tinge, and even Aquinas the Aristotelian often followed his lead. Wycliffe, Hus, and Luther believed they were returning to Augustine when they left the church, and Calvin based his ruthless creed upon Augustine's theories of the elect and the damned. At the same time that he stimulated men of intellect, he became an inspiration to those whose Christianity was more of the heart than of the head. Mystics tried to retrace his steps in seeking a vision of God, and men and women found food and phrases for their piety in the humility and tenderness of his prayers. It may be the secret of his influence that he united and strengthened both the philosophical and the mystical strains in Christianity, and opened a path not only for Thomas Aquinas, but for Thomas Akempis as well. His subjective, emotional, anti-intellectual emphasis marked the end of classical, the triumph of medieval literature. To understand the Middle Ages we must forget our modern rationalism, our proud confidence in reason and science, our restless search after wealth and power and an earthly paradise. We must enter sympathetically into the mood of men disillusioned of these pursuits, standing at the end of a thousand years of rationalism, 
finding all dreams of utopia shattered by war and poverty and barbarism, seeking consolation in the hope of happiness beyond the grave, inspired and comforted by the story and figure of Christ, throwing themselves upon the mercy and goodness of God, and living in the thought of His eternal presence, His inescapable judgment, and the atoning death of His Son. St. Augustine, above all others, and even in the age of Symmachus, Claudian, and Dawsonius, reveals and phrases this mood. He is the most authentic, eloquent, and powerful voice of the age of faith in Christendom. 6. THE CHURCH AND THE WORLD Augustine's argument against paganism was the last rebuttal in the greatest of historic debates. Paganism survived in the moral sense, as a joyous indulgence of natural appetites, as a religion it remained only in the form of ancient rites and customs condoned, or accepted and transformed, by an often indulgent church. An intimate and trustful worship of saints replaced the cult of the pagan gods, and satisfied the congenial polytheism of simple or poetic minds. Statues of Isis and Horus were renamed Mary and Jesus. The Roman Lupercalia and the Feast of the Purification of Isis became the Feast of the Nativity. The Saturnalia were replaced by Christmas celebrations, the Floralia by Pentecost, an ancient festival of the dead by All Souls' Day, the resurrection of Attis by the resurrection of Christ. Pagan altars were rededicated to Christian heroes. Incense, lights, flowers, processions, vestments, hymns, which had pleased the people in older cults, were domesticated and cleansed in the ritual of the church. And the harsh slaughter of a living victim was sublimated in the spiritual sacrifice of the Mass. Augustine had protested against the adoration of saints, and in terms that Voltaire might have used in dedicating his chapel at Ferney, let us not treat the saints as gods. We do not wish to imitate those pagans who adore the dead. Let us not build them temples, nor raise altars to them, but with their relics let us raise an altar to the one God. The Church, however, wisely accepted the inevitable anthropomorphism of popular theology. She resisted, then used, then abused the cult of martyrs and relics. She opposed the worship of images and icons, and warned her faithful that these should be reverenced only as symbols. But the ardor of public feeling overcame these cautions, and led to the excesses that aroused the Byzantine iconoclasts. The Church denounced magic, astrology, and divination, but medieval, like ancient literature, was full of them. Soon people and priests would use the sign of the cross as a magic incantation to expel or drive away demons. Exorcisms were pronounced over the candidate for baptism, and total nude immersion was required lest a devil should hide in some clothing or ornament. The dream cures once sought in the temples of Aesculapius could now be obtained in the sanctuary of Saints Cosmas and Damian in Rome, and would soon be available at a hundred shrines. In such matters it was not the priests who corrupted the people, but the people who persuaded the priests. The soul of the simple man can be moved only through the senses and the imagination, by ceremony and miracle, by myth and fear and hope. He will reject or transform any religion that does not give him these. It was natural that amid war and desolation, poverty and disease, a frightened people should find refuge and solace in chapels, churches, and cathedrals, in mystic lights and rejoicing bells, in processions, festivals, and colorful ritual. By yielding to these popular necessities, the Church was enabled to inculcate a new morality. Ambrose, always the Roman administrator, had tried to formulate the ethics of Christianity in Stoic terms, converting Cicero to his needs. And in the greater Christians of the Middle Ages, from Augustine to Savonarola, the Stoic ideal of self-control and uncompromising virtue informed the Christian mold. But that masculine morality was not the ideal of the people. They had had Stoics long enough. They had seen the masculine virtues in Carnadine half the world. They longed for gentler, quieter ways by which men might be persuaded to live in stability and peace. For the first time in European history, the teachers of mankind preached an ethic of kindliness, obedience, humility, patience, mercy, purity, chastity, and tenderness, virtues perhaps derived from the lowly social origins of the Church and their popularity among women, but admirably adapted to restore order to a demoralized people, to tame the marauding barbarian, to moderate the violence of a falling world. The reforms of the Church were greatest in the realm of sex. Paganism had tolerated the prostitute as a necessary mitigation of an arduous monogamy. The Church denounced prostitution without compromise and demanded a single standard of fidelity for both sexes in marriage. She did not quite succeed. 
She raised the morals of the home, but prostitution remained, driven into stealth and degradation. Perhaps to counterbalance a sexual instinct that had run wild, the new morality exaggerated chastity into an obsession, and subordinated marriage and parentage to a lifelong virginity or celibacy as an ideal. And it took the fathers of the church some time to realize that no society could survive on such sterile principles. But this puritanic reaction can be understood if we recall the licentiousness of the Roman stage, the schools of prostitution in some Greek and Oriental temples, the widespread abortion and infanticide, the obscene paintings on Pompeian walls, the unnatural vice so popular in Greece and Rome, the excesses of the early emperors, the sensuality of the upper classes as revealed in Catullus and Martial, Tacitus and Juvenal. The church finally reached a healthier view, and indeed came in time to take a lenient attitude to sins of the flesh. Meanwhile, some injury was done to the conception of parentage and the family. Too many Christians of these early centuries thought that they could serve God best, or rather most easily escape hell, by abandoning their parents, mates, or children, and fleeing from the responsibilities of life in the frightened pursuit of a selfishly individual salvation. In paganism, the family had been the social and religious unit, it was a loss that in medieval Christianity this unit became the individual. Nevertheless, the church strengthened the family by surrounding marriage with a solemn ceremony and exalting it from a contract to a sacrament. By making matrimony indissoluble, she raised the security and dignity of the wife and encouraged the patience that comes from hopelessness. For a time the status of woman was hurt by the doctrine of some Christian fathers that woman was the origin of sin and the instrument of Satan but some amends were made by the honors paid to the mother of God. Having accepted marriage, the church blessed abundant motherhood and sternly forbade abortion or infanticide. Perhaps it was to discourage these practices that her theologians damned to a limbo of eternal darkness any child that died without baptism. It was through the influence of the church that Valentinian I, in 374, made infanticide a capital crime. The church did not condemn slavery— Orthodox and heretic, Roman and barbarian alike, assumed the institution to be natural and indestructible. A few philosophers protested, but they too had slaves. The legislation of the Christian emperors in this matter does not compare favorably with the laws of Antoninus Pius or Marcus Aurelius. Pagan laws condemned to slavery any free woman who married a slave. The laws of Constantine ordered the woman to be executed and the slave to be burned alive. The emperor Gratian decreed that a slave who accused his master of any offense except high treason to the state should be burned alive at once, without inquiry into the justice of the charge. But though the church accepted slavery as part of the law of war, she did more than any other institution of the time to mitigate the evils of servitude. She proclaimed, through the fathers, the principle that all men are by nature equal, presumably meaning in legal and moral rights. She practiced the principle insofar as she received into her communion all ranks and classes. Though no slave could be ordained to the priesthood, the poorest freedman could rise to high places in the ecclesiastical hierarchy. The church repudiated the distinction made in pagan law between wrongs done to a freeman and those done to a slave. She encouraged manumission, made emancipation of slaves a mode of expiating sins, or of celebrating some good fortune, or of approaching the judgment seat of God. She spent great sums freeing from slavery Christians captured in war. Nevertheless, slavery continued throughout the Middle Ages and died without benefit of clergy. The outstanding moral distinction of the Church was her extensive provision of charity. The pagan emperors had provided state funds for poor families, and pagan magnates had done something for their clients and the poor. But never had the world seen such a dispensation of alms as was now organized by the Church. She encouraged bequests to the poor to be administered by her, some abuses and malversation crept in, but that the Church carried out her obligations abundantly is attested by the jealous emulation of Julian. She helped widows, orphans, the sick or infirm, prisoners, victims of natural catastrophes, and she frequently intervened to protect the lower orders from unusual exploitation or excessive taxation. In many cases, priests, on attaining the episcopacy, gave all their property to the poor. Christian women like Fabiola, Paula, and Melania devoted fortunes to charitable work. Following the example of pagan valetudinaria, the church or her rich layman founded public hospitals on a scale never known before. Basil established a famous hospital and the first asylum for lepers at Caesarea in Cappadocia. Xenodokia, refuges for wayfarers, rose along pilgrim routes. The Council of Nicaea ordered that one should be provided in every city, 
Widows were enlisted to distribute charity and found in this work a new significance for their lonely lives. Pagans admired the steadfastness of Christians in caring for the sick in cities stricken with famine or pestilence. What did the church do in these centuries for the minds of men? As Roman schools still existed, she did not feel it her function to promote intellectual development. She exalted feeling above intellect, and in this sense Christianity was a romantic reaction against the classic trust in reason. Rousseau was merely a lesser Augustine. Convinced that survival demanded organization, that organization required agreement on basic principles and beliefs, and that the vast majority of her adherents longed for authoritatively established beliefs, the Church defined her creed in unchangeable dogmas, made doubt a sin, and entered upon an unending conflict with the fluent intellect and changeable ideas of men. She claimed that through divine revelation she had found the answers to the old problems of origin, nature, and destiny. We who are instructed in the knowledge of truth by the Holy Scriptures, wrote Lactantius in 307, know the beginning of the world and its end. Tertullian had said as much a century before in 197, and had suggested a cloture on philosophy. Having displaced the axis of men's concern from this world to the next, Christianity offered supernatural explanations for historical events, and thereby passively discouraged the investigation of natural causes. Many of the advances made by Greek science through seven centuries were sacrificed to the cosmology and biology of Genesis. Did Christianity bring a literary decline? Most of the fathers were hostile to pagan literature, as permeated by a demonic polytheism and a degrading immorality. But the greatest of the fathers loved the classics notwithstanding, and Christians like Fortunatus, Prudentius, Jerome, Sidonius, and Ausonius aspired to write verse like Virgil's or prose like Cicero's. Gregory Nazianzen, Chrysostom, Ambrose, Jerome, and Augustine outweigh even in a literary sense their pagan contemporaries, Ammianus, Symmachus, Claudian, Julian. But after Augustine prose style decayed, written Latin took over the rough vocabulary and careless syntax of the popular speech, and Latin verse for a time deteriorated into doggerel before molding new forms into majestic hymns. The basic cause of cultural retrogression was not Christianity, but barbarism, not religion, but war. The human inundations ruined or impoverished cities, monasteries, libraries, schools, and made possible the life of the scholar or the scientist. Perhaps the destruction would have been worse had not the church maintained some measure of order in a crumbling civilization. Amid the agitations of the world, said Ambrose, the church remains unmoved. The waves cannot shake her. While around her everything is in a horrible chaos, she offers to all the shipwrecked a tranquil port where they will find safety. And often it was so. The Roman Empire had raised science, prosperity, and power to their ancient peaks. The decay of the empire in the West, the growth of poverty, and the spread of violence necessitated some new ideal and hope to give men consolation in their suffering and courage in their toil. An age of power gave way to an age of faith. Not till wealth and pride should return in the Renaissance would reason reject faith and abandon heaven for utopia. But if thereafter reason should fail and science should find no answers, but should multiply knowledge and power without improving conscience or purpose, if all utopias should brutally collapse in the changeless abuse of the weak by the strong, then men would understand why once their ancestors in the barbarism of those early Christian centuries turned from science, knowledge, power, and pride, and took refuge for a thousand years in humble faith, hope, and charity.